Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the Masters of Science um, in Information Technology Virtual Information Session. Uh, this should be a, a great event. Um, we're going to take you behind the scenes and, and help you preview your experience in the Masters in IT. The MSIT program is how we affectionately refer to it. Uh, my name is Tom Cresham, I'm the Director of Graduate Admissions. I'll be your host tonight. Um, Dr. Lamaki and Dr. Uh, Mihal, would you mind introducing yourselves? Sure. I'm uh, Dr. Carolyn Lamakia. I'm a faculty member in the program. Scott Mihal, also a faculty member in the program. Great, great. So the event should take around uh, 30, between 30 and 40 minutes. Um, again, we have a, a bunch of topics to cover. Um, after the presentation, we are going to open it up to a Q&A. Um, so if there's any questions from, from the group, so whether you're watching live or you're watching the recording, you know, please feel free to, um, you know, ask questions and then we'll get back to you very quickly. Um, but Dr. Uh, Mihal, would you mind sharing your, your presentation and we'll go ahead and kick it off? Absolutely. There we go. Um, so I'm Scott Mihal. I'm a professor in the Department of Technology Analytics and Workforce Learning, and I teach a few classes in the MSIT program. Um, I teach business intelligence and analytics. I teach a class on Power BI, um, strategic information technology management, and a class called Innovations, Innovation Projects. Excuse me. Um, so my background is in online learning. This program being an online um, program really lends itself well to, to that. Um, I have some interests in augmented and virtual reality for learning as well, um, and analytics, of course. And I'll turn it over to Carolyn now to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Carolyn Lamakia, and I also teach in the program, and I am the coordinator of the program. So I would be your primary advisor uh, if you join our program. And I teach multiple classes, some are required and some are electives. Uh, like I teach enterprise architecture and security, and I also am teaching a software development class. So that's some samples of what I teach. And what are some of your research interests, Dr. Lamaki and Dr. Mihal? Well, I, I do research in cybersecurity, um, and I do research in analytics topics and in blockchain. Okay. That's for me, most of my research focuses on the intersection of technology and learning. Um, so a lot of online learning um, studies, um, augmented and virtual reality applications for learning. Um, right now, Carolyn and I are actually working on um, something related to learning analytics online and that experience. Um, so that's where most of my research is focused. And I will say the addition to of Dr. Mihal to our department uh, several years ago has really helped us develop um, nice online learning, online learning platforms for our master's students. He's been a terrific leader in that respect. Yeah, definitely. The the, the faculty um, that are in the uh, the ITA department have a, a really wide and varied set of interests. And I think so for the students, that means that like a lot of these different topics are covered. Right. So like IT is a very broad field. The good news is there's faculty on staff that have specialties in a lot of those different fields. So you're going to get a, you know, a great viewpoint of, of all the potential career outcomes um, throughout the program. Mm -hmm. Sure. So Dr. Mihal, would you, would you yes, yeah, so would you mind giving us just a quick overview? Sure. Um, how about if I do that, Scott? Is that okay? Sure. Um, we have 100% online delivery, although the faculty in the program are located on the Bloomsburg campus, and we are here multiple times in person. All of our classes are delivered in this program 100% online. There is no required meetings at scheduled times, although many of the courses have optional meetings scheduled. So we're available to you, but it is a work at your own pace type of a program for the course delivery. Um, we have 10 courses in the program, so it's 30 credits. Each course is three credits. And you can complete the, the program in less than a year, or you can work at your own pace. You could take up to four classes during a semester or take two, take three, take one, whatever uh, works with your lifestyle. And our courses, each one is six weeks in length. 
They are accelerated courses, so you can focus on the particular technology topic. So you would only take two courses at a time in a semester for six weeks instead of taking uh, four classes for 14 weeks. So it's two and two instead of four over 14. And we found that this has worked terrific with technology topics. So you're not getting confused and you can focus on a particular area. Our students come from a variety of undergraduate backgrounds. You do not have to have a technology undergraduate degree to do well in our program. So uh, Dr. Lamaki, so for students who don't have an, a technology degree as an undergrad, what is the, like, what's the adoption process? Like, what's it like for a student with the communications or an English back or, uh, English background or, you know, uh, media and journalism normally, like what types of things are they using in classes that they might want to start to get prepared with? Well, I will say that more than half of our students do not have a technology background. Okay. We have three types of students. We have the type that are coming from a program that does not have a technology background and they're not able to get gainful employment and they realize our field is um, a place that has lots of job opportunities. We also have uh, IT professionals that want to get to the next level. And we also have people that were in a certain field, like um, I'll give you an example. We've had an somebody that was in nursing and did not want to do patient care anymore and wanted to switch to an IT type of field. And I will say the way we teach our classes, we bring you from ground zero, as long as you're able to work hard, focus, um, be a critical thinker, you're able to uh, succeed in our courses. I personally cannot tell the difference between a student that does not have a technology background and one that does. It's more about their work ethic and their critical thinking skills that makes them a good student. Do you agree with me, Scott? Yeah, I would, I, I would absolutely agree with that and um, just say that most of these other fields, people are working with data already. They might just not call it that and they might use different terminologies. And I just wanted to add there as well, all our classes are asynchronous. So if you've had like um, an online class before that heavily use Zoom sessions and live synchronous sessions and that sort of thing, um, we don't do much of that at all. And that's by design. That's to allow you the most flexible experience possible where you get to sort of decide what part of the week that you complete your work in. As long as you're meeting your deadlines, meeting your due dates, we have interactivity built into all of our online courses where we'll have lecture videos, we'll have interactive assignments for you. And probably most important is that pretty much all of our classes are project focused, meaning you're going to actually be doing stuff hands on in our classes, getting feedback from us on those projects, on those sort of sub projects um, and, and doing something more authentic to what you would do in the job, in the real world. Um, so th this, pro this program is really attractive to students who want to work full-time or part-time while they're doing it and who are self-directed learners who can um, sort of map out their schedule each week and say, okay, I know on Wednesdays I'm going to do my schoolwork. I don't need to attend, you know, synchronous sessions or go to physical classes. So that's sort of the, the really um, beneficial component of it. So that's really interesting. So Dr. Mihal, then are, so basically it sounds like what students are doing is they're kind of completing the degree, you know, kind of completing the credential at the same time, building almost like not only are building a resume, but building like a portfolio of work that they're then able to talk about when they graduate. Um, so that, that yeah, that's great to hear that. So, uh, you know, application based because it's, you know, it, I'm sure there's probably some theory, but as a grad student, you've probably done a good amount of theory. Like you're probably ready for something a little more hands-on. That's exactly what you're going to get in this degree. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, absolutely. Well, Dr. Mihal even brought a project uh, with him to show you if we have time. Yeah, that would be great. Um, so when we talk about accelerated six-week classes, how intense are they? You know, typically, um, what's the time commitment for an, acceler an accelerated six-week course? You want to take that, Scott? 
or would you? Yeah, sure. So it's a it's a three credit class, just like any other um, three credit class. It's compressed. But typically our students are taking one or two of them at a time. And that's sort of the big okay. difference. It might be the same amount of workload as any other graduate program. But instead of doing two to four classes at a time, you're taking one or two. Mm -hmm. So for our students, most of them really like this because you don't have to constantly be cognitively switching gears from one class to another class and uh, doing that over the course of maybe 14 or 15 weeks. You're starting a class week one and you're finishing it week six um, and you're going to be doing a project at, for at least half of that class in most of our classes. So um, it's it's not any more work than any other class it, or any other program. It's just um, a sort of a different format in terms of how we how we structure the courses. And I'd like to add to this that typically in most classes, there is a delivery each week to keep somebody on track and gain feedback. So um, we open up the weekly information on the one weekend and in, early in the weekend, and then it's due the next weekend um, late into the weekend so that they have almost two full weekends and a week to create these intermediate, intermediate steps along the way, which the students have find to be very helpful. And then we give them feedback so they know where they stand. And that's super helpful. Okay, so um, here's some information about our curriculum. Um, there is 10 classes, each is three credits, and we have required core classes. There's seven of them. And here are some of the titles of those classes. And as you see, we teach the information technology environment, the architecture, and then we um, really focus a lot of our classes on um, managing and analyzing the data because that is um, where many jobs are available for um, MSIT graduates. So, um, I'll give you an example of some of these classes that we teach. Like right now I'm teaching um, the 510 class. And that class I talk about um, software development that happens in house and the steps. But I also talk about what typically happens in a software environment at a organization is not where they're developing from scratch, Instead, they're analyzing various applications that are available to an organization. So we teach them how to, um, what to look at when you're purchasing software. And we also um, emphasize the fact that often there's several applications within an organization and interfaces need to be built to connect the applications together. Sometimes they're not a seamless integration. So we have incorporated a lab with that class that teaches the students Python. And this is the first semester we have done this. And um, I have some MBA students in this class, taking the class um, as elective. And I have our IT classes and they are just really loving this lab work that we have because they're walked through the fundamentals of Python programming, and they feel like they are accomplishing the skills of understanding how data is defined and how it's manipulated by a computer. And in the end, they're, the last project is where they're manipulating data in an Excel file um, through the Python language and cleaning up the data and um, creating new fields within that Excel file. So it's very much uh, applicable to the real world. And there, I haven't had a student that hasn't been able to do the work. They're really, you know, I'm getting a lot of terrific feedback because of the way this is presented. So um, that's something that, like Dr. Mihal mentioned, that is applicable to, you know, the real world, that they're able to, incorporate this and hit the ground running in another place because they know how to do this work. 
Yeah, no, that that's that's great. So, um, Dr. Lamaki, what are some of your favorite classes to te teach? Like, if, if you know, what are the ones that you, I'm sure like it's, it's kind of like it's your children, you love them all. Um, but like, if you had to pick one, like, what are some of your favorite subjects to teach, and what might students be doing in some of those classes? Okay, I like the enterprise architecture and cybersecurity class a lot because I was a um, technical architect mm -hmm. in my prior career. Mm -hmm. And that's where you understand how an organization uh, has all of their hardware and software and network and applications established and you're managing the whole architecture. And that's a pretty terrific job. You probably wouldn't get that right when you got out of school, but it's something that someone could shoot for as a um, IT professional. And I, I like doing that work, but you also have to do the enterprise architecture if you're adopting a new process or application. So it's transferable to a lower level type of job where you're just involved in implementing one project. And also we have the cybersecurity angle to it. And I have a lot of research in that area. And I find that's always um, a growing, interesting, challenging uh, topic and all uh, professionals need to be exposed to ways to manage cybersecurity. So that's a fun class to teach. Dr. Mihal, how about you? Uh, that's a great question. I would probably say the 520 business intelligence and analytics, because it is like start to finish all hands-on application work with SaaS visual analytics. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot of getting a business problem, getting a data set associated with that problem. And now you're going to build reports, dashboards to answer those questions. So it's all pretty much hands-on work. Um, mm -hmm. And we do it from a lot of different industries. So we do like professional sports data, yeah, hospital yeah. systems data, um, supply chain. Uh, we do one with a toy company. So all kinds of different sort of applications. And it, that's really to drive home the point of that. Everything we do in that class and really in our program isn't industry specific. It is for any industry, every job out there today pretty much uses data, uses analytics in some way. And I do wanna sort of take the opportunity to mention a lot of these topics, when you just look at them at first, they seem intimidating. They seem like they're really complex or technical um, and we do a lot of demystifying, I would say, of this technical jargon when we get into these classes. Um, for example, our 572 course, Strategic Information Technology Management, that class has become really popular and is now used by the MBA program, the MAC, the Masters of Accountancy students, and now one of the nursing programs, the Masters of Nursing program um, as well. So a lot of our classes are sort of gaining popularity because they're technical topics, but I would like to think we do a really good job of sort of um, uh, teaching them in a way that's relatable. And in pretty much all of them, you come out of it with either some skill or a skill plus a certificate. So we have uh, SQL, we have Python, as Dr. Lomachia mentioned, we have SAS Visual Analytics and SAS Studio, we have Power BI, uh, and a couple others that we have embedded in these classes. So when you're doing your hands-on projects and maybe your final projects in these classes, you're doing them from some technology tool or within some technology tool, and you're learning about the tool and how to use it. And then we try to structure it to where you get to come out of those classes with something to put on your resume for each of them. Because at the end of the day, our goal is to get you a job or to get you a promotion. Yeah, and for a grad student, like you're 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 ready. Like you're you're kind of you're probably chomping at the bit to hit the job market if you're not already employed. So it's it's a lot, it's more palatable almost to be like, all right, I'm actively working towards building that resume. You know, the other thing you have to keep in mind too is um whether you're a young working professional or you're coming right out of undergrad, I would imagine that's probably, you know, more um probably a majority of the students that go into the program, there is always that concern that I hear from under, from, you know, prospective students that, oh, I don't want to be overeducated and underprepared. Like I have all these fancy degrees, but I have very little experience. It's not really something you're going to have to worry about in this program, right? Like you're going to be able, like you're going to sit in class or not necessarily in class, but you're going to participate in class and you're going to be building your resume simultaneously. And there's not a lot of programs where that's an option. 
Um, so I think this program does a great job of kind of getting you ready. So the second you hit the job market, you are ready to go. Yeah, great question. Um, can you talk a little more about the the electives where, you know, it looks like students have the opportunity to kind of personalize their, their curriculum a little bit? Well, we offer an elective every semester or session. We try, we're going to try to offer more than one, but right now with staffing, we only offer, offer one in the fall, uh, one over winter, one in the spring, and one in the summer. So a minimum of four, and hopefully we'll be offering more. And what we do is we have a course that's called Special Topics, and we try out a topic. And when we see that it's something that students have an interest in and it's successful, we turn it into a regular course. And um, we have some really interesting ones up there. Um, we have Sports Analytics. That's going to be uh, something Dr. Mihal developed. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that one, Dr. Mihal? Yeah, it's again sort of a, a hands-on class where we take data from the sports world, mostly from professional sports, and apply analytical models to this data to drive decision making. So it could be something from injury prevention or roster building or salary decisions, anything along those lines. And we use an analytics tool um, to sort of visualize the uh, the statistical models behind these things. And we so find is, that this type of stuff is applicable in any industry, but we want to do something that interests uh, people. And we were offering various sports analytics um, projects within our classes or in the undergrad as an option. And students started asking for it because it's something that they find entertaining while they're learning. So it, it's, it's kind of like, I don't know if for the people who are watching live or watching a recording, it's like, is it like Moneyball? Um, you know, it's uh, the, the, um, the book and I, I can't think of the, of the author now, uh, but that, you know, it's a famous book, became a famous movie with, with Brad Pitt and Joan Hill. And it's kind of about like the analytics of, you know, how, how a baseball team applied analytics to build a roster and, and achieve a lot of success. So that, that's actually, that's really interesting. That's, no, I had that. I had them program that uh, equation in one of my classes. Oh, did you really? <laughs> yes, which was uh, you know you have to earn, you have to score more runs than uh, the other team scores. Oh, looked at the results, and we we you know manipulate yeah. the formula. Mm -hmm. It was fun, and it's just a fun thing. It applies to all yeah. topics. Another one we like teaching is blockchain. Mm -hmm. And that was a special topic that turned into a course and uh, students really enjoy that. And we get people from all sorts of graduate majors uh, in our classes elective with some of these things. Uh, mm -hmm. Scott just developed this Power BI class and that was very uh, successful. So this is just some of the things that we, we, you know, we take a topic that might be an emerging technology or something we see a lot on the job market and we offer a class and uh, folks get two of these during their, um, out of their 10, two that they can pick, which they like that flexibility and freedom. And um, then we have our practicum, which is, you, you should take that after you have 21 credits, but we have been flexible, you know, to fit it into people's uh, personal life. For example, if a project comes up where they're working, and it would be a special project that they could use some of their IT skills from this program. We'll have them do that project, you know, that idea when they're ready. But typically after about 21 credits, you take this practicum. It could be an internship, it could be a project, or it could be a research type of um, report. So we're flexible. We help this be a um, applied experience for our students. Yeah, no, that's great. It's great to hear. Um, this is a little bit about our professors. We have experience in industry. We're not um, just from um, academic backgrounds. And we have had consulting, telecommunications, international manufacturing, and digital learning and innovation is some of the areas that we have experience. And um, there is internship options through some of our connections and also through some of the resources at the university. And because we have this background, we're 
prepared to do this applied approach to instruction. Um, we feel like people learn better by doing. And as we said before, we have project-oriented courses. Would you like to add anything, Scott? Uh, I'll just add there that um, one of the things that we make a point in doing is uh, staying in contact with folks from industry, as well as combing through the the job postings that are out there to see what are employers actually looking for, what types of skills and technologies do they have on their job applications. That's really where um, the Power BI course originated because we started seeing Power BI become uh, a fixture in a lot of these technology-focused jobs. Uh, and a lot of organizations have turned their uh, BI focus towards Power BI. So we said we better stay current as well and uh, you know develop some some content in there. So you'll get Power BI in the Power BI elective course, but it's also built into the 572, the Strategic Information Technology Management course. Um, and again, that's be because we want to stay current as the job market evolves because it occurs really rapidly in these technology fields. Yes. Yeah, the responsiveness seems to be something that would work to the to the benefit of the student. You know, so it's you're not learning something that's outdated and and you know the faculty having, you know, in, important experience, you know, so you're not just talking about things you read in a textbook, right? You're talking about projects that you worked on and directed yourself. Yeah. Here's some of the careers that we see folks um apply and get positions in um analysts anything that has the word analyst um is something that they could um you know if they're doing a search on a job look for the word analyst and you'll see quite a few different types of analysts whether you're analyzing the it architecture or business processes or data or well, you know there's many many positions um, there's project management types of positions available. Um, you could be a software or web developer if, if you wanted to be a programmer. We have enough exposure for that uh, to get you started. And uh, information security analyst, um, that's with the cybersecurity and data analyst uh, courses. You can look for those types of jobs. Uh, data warehouse analysts building uh, data warehouses for organizations. That's a very popular uh, field for folks to have openings. And then if you want to go, um, you know, be able to, you pr probably should already be in the IT industry, but it would help you get the promotion to those uh, C-suite type of jobs because you have a graduate degree now. Because we do have some folks that have the IT undergrad and they have the experience but they want the master's degree to be um, considered polished enough for these high level jobs, like a chief technology officer, chief information officer. Yeah, and, and that's a great point too, where, you know, for those of you who are watching, if you are already working in the field, the value of having this, like you already have the job, right? But the value of having the master's degree is gonna unlock management potential. There, there's very few positions out there that are management, upper level, C-suite, where a master's degree is at the minimum expectation. Um, so it is something that's expected for someone who is, you know, gonna gonna progress and, and kind of move up the ladder is that you have an advanced degree. Um, so there's there's really so, something to be gained for anybody regardless of, of kind of their career um, trajectory or where they're at in their academic career as well um, with, with, with this degree. Yes, but those career options above the chief, they you're, you'll be ready for them when you graduate with this degree, but the chief ones, um, you know, you would have to have some experience. Yep. Yep. Dr. Lamaki is going to have to put you in contact with some of her, her contacts in the field to, to get to that point. So this is one of the very uh, popular, um, tremendous job growth areas for uh, international and local <laughs> and national types of jobs. It's just as a, if you think about it, IT is involved in all industries and it's um, it's not going to change. It's getting stronger and stronger. Um, what I like about uh, the world now is 
it's even opened up um, your geographical area is opened up even greater because there is more jobs available that are, can be completed online. Um, there is a lot of flexibility in the job. If you want to go there uh, five days a week in an office, you can apply for those types of jobs. If you want to go in once a week or twice a week, there's lots of those types of jobs. And then there's totally remote jobs. We have some folks that um, have very lucrative jobs paying almost $100 thousand dollars and they're only out of school a couple of years and they wanted to work at home and they are working at home but some folks you know that's not what they really want what is nice about this is it's flexible any industry any working conditions that you're interested in the the job outlook is there you can find your niche yeah, um, Dr. Mihal, do you have anything to add about some of the the, the career options, um, or or Dr. Lamaki? Like, what I, I know, um, you know, no two jobs are the same, but what are some of the characteristics of a job like this? Is this like a job where you are, you know, you're you know primarily working, you know, kind of sitting behind a computer, or or is this like? Um, it seems like IT is you are almost like the 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 intermediary between a maybe someone with like a, a computer science background and like an end user, um, mm -hmm. where you're kind of like translating, you know, what some of these things might mean. Does that does that make sense? Am I mm -hmm. even close? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would even say that our graduates aren't um, pigeonholed into just IT jobs. A lot of our graduates go and work in just anything related to technology. Um, so, you know, you could work in marketing, you could work in finance, you could work uh, in sports, plenty of different sectors and of different parts of companies, um, not just like what you would typically think of an IT department with this degree. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is really a big focus of ours as well, of why we spend so much time using examples from different industries of different parts of companies, because we recognize that our graduates don't just go and get stuck in an IT department for their careers. Our graduates end up all over organizations and in different industries. And it really the common theme among the jobs that they get is it is technology focused jobs. Yeah. No, that's lots great. of data, lots of data analysis is happening and decisions are made based on uh, quantitative reasoning and you're prepared to understand what data you need, where you can get it, and how to analyze it through this degree. So it does complement many different um, areas. But I don't see most of our jobs as sitting behind a computer. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're, you're, um, most of our jobs, the folks are working with business people yeah. or with customers and clients. Mm -hmm. It's not the type of job where you're in a cubicle or sitting at home behind a computer eight hours a day. It's basically not what you would see in, in you know, have this position portrayed in pop culture. Um, you know, like the movies uh, might not do a great job of showing like what this job is. And, and the reality is it seems like this is a career that's like a foundational piece of any organization. Like you're going to find IT, IT professionals in every company in America. Because you have to have it, and you know, twenty twenty three moving forward, like you're gonna, this is this is foundational, um, and that's good news for people going into this field, because you know you're entering, you know, a really lucrative um, job market, um, and you're gonna be in high demand. And you know, Dr. Lamake, you had mentioned earlier too that um, because you're in such high demand, and kind of given the nature of the profession, you have more flexibility than what you might have in other fields. So you can work remotely, you could live in the South of France, right. And, and work for a company, you know, across the world. Um, you know, you've got that type of flexibility. Not every job is going to be like that. Um, this is one where it works out pretty well though. So that that's nice for, for people. And I think, you know, you mentioned Dr. Lamaki, you, you know, even in your career, you, you've always had a lot of flexibility. Um, a lot of it was project-based. So if you're looking for something like that, and frankly, most people are, you know, the more flexibility, the better Then this is, this is the right field. This is some of the alumni positions um, that we, um, our graduates have gotten. 
So um, I think it would be, I'm wondering if any of our um, participants would want to ask any questions during our Q&A about some of these positions and what they mean. Well, and can, I, I always wonder, um, and I'm sorry to be selfish here. So when we talk about, you know, like, again, these these titles all set, sound so distinct. So when you look at like a data analyst team lead, like what, what might what might someone like that be doing or a workstation analyst? Um, what are some of the projects that some you know people employed in some of these fields might be working on? Well, I remember our data analyst team lead. <laughs> I did the practicum project with that person, and they were trying to. Uh, it's a smaller company, but it's nice enough size. And they were trying to analyze data for efficiencies within the company. And they were, uh, the project that uh, we were working on for his um, practicum had to do with um, taking care of the, the fleet of trucks um, and making sure that they were, um, you know, uh, the maintenance was done and they would track the maintenance and gather the data for the maintenance. Uh, he had also was trying to uh, track the fuel usage so that they would know uh, with the, all the equipment, how much fuel that they would need for um, expected jobs so that they could um, organize and um, purchase the fuel at the right time. So it, he was looking at all of this, efficiencies in the actual um, operations of the company and gathering the data, what was the easiest, best place to gather the data so it would be accurate and what were the reports that would help that company analyze that information to find ways to become more effective. And that that's what that person did. And um, they did that because they were in this they got that job title because they were in this um, degree. Um, let's see. Um, another, the technology security um, analyst um, would implement projects and software systems to analyze the uh, security architecture of the company. Um, various tools that you can purchase to um, watch your network and gather information about um, when various transactions are processed during your company, what is considered typical and uh, finding anomalies so that if all of a sudden there's a lot of updates in a certain area and there normally isn't, that's like an example of uh, the anomaly that you would say, oh, we might be having a breach. Uh, you would be implementing um, procedures on when uh, people extract company information, either on a USB or what are they emailing to one another, like to set up procedures and processes and clearances for for folks. So you're looking at the entire organizations, technology, architecture to um, make sure that you have a secure environment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So would you like to lead this, Tom? Yeah, so as you talk about the application and the admission process, it is, it, it's simple, it's meant to be streamlined. Um, so the, we have the online application, uh, the transcripts, the resume, the letters of rec, and you can see there is no GRE or GMAT required. Um, at this point, you've finished a, a bachelor's degree or nearing the end of a bachelor's degree. So there's more than enough information that we need to be able to kind of render a decision as to whether or not you would be a good candidate. Um, Dr. Lamakian mentioned earlier in the presentation that we do accept applications fall, spring, and, and summer. Um, so, you know, we would call that rolling admissions. Um, but again, the application is, is pretty simple. Um, by attending this virtual event also too, should you choose to apply, we will waive your application fee. Um, but there's not a ton of 
a ton of boundaries, I guess, is, is what is the word I'm looking for um, to continuing your education here at, at, at CU Bloomsburg. Um, so, again, we view this as a good investment in your future career. Right. Um, the, there has never been a better time to get into this field. Um, so, again, we want to make the application, the admission process as, as simple as possible. So we're not really holding you up and, and we can get you into classes. So it's kind of the long and the short of, of the application and the admission process. Um, and, and Dr. Lamakia, I believe that's the is that the final slide then for Dr. Mihal? This is um, it. Yeah. So if anybody has an, any questions or Dr. Lamaki is contact info. So again, whether you're watching live or you're watching the recording, um, you know, we are happy to help in any way that we can. We work for you, right? Um, and we're happy to do so. Um, so if I anyone who's watching- I want to add one thing though. I want oh, yeah. to say that um, our program is AACSB accredited and that's a, a gold standard that we have met. Um, so that's one other thing that you should consider when you're comparing programs that we do have that accreditation. Um, AACSB. So when, when we say it's good, you don't have to take our word for it. Yes. AACSB certified that. Um, yes. and, and, and that it's a, it's a really rigorous certification process. I want to say something like 5% of business schools in the world carry that accreditation. So our college of business, you know, the Ziegler College of Business is elite in every sense of the word. So, um, and, you know, the IT program, the MSIT program is a part of that. Yes. Um. So I, I know there are definitely some questions that, that we typically get um, when I work with prospective students about the MSIT program. So if anyone who's watching live has any questions, you know, you can feel free to ask. But um, as we kind of wait, um, one of the things that um, that I hear frequently from from students is, you know, what, what um, you know, if I don't have a degree that's in a, a, a tech uh, field, what are some of the programs I should be expected to, to know, right? Um, what are some of the, the, the programs that I'll be using in the program? Or using in, in the in the degree um, again? Are there we talk about barriers of entry with the application process? Are there any barriers to entry in terms of knowledge, or is basically this is all things that you can be taught in the program? Yes, um, there is no uh, prerequisite classes. You need to show that you were a good undergraduate student and pass the admission process, and we bring you from where you are to where you need to be. So there is no, uh, the tools that we use, we know how to explain them. You start working with them, you get some confidence and you know, with our support, you'll be successful. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, is, is this a program that can be completed while people are working full-time? Um, I know most of the classes, if not all of them are asynchronous. So what is that, what's the process typically like for students or you know, for who are working 40 hours a week have a family and what have you, um, what's the pace that they normally go at? And I guess, first of all, is that even possible? Yeah, that's definitely possible. I mean, we have a number of students who are working 40 hours a week or more um, taking the program. I'm not sure how many of those are in the accelerated track. Carolyn could answer that um, if they're doing the one year versus um, the two years or more. Uh, but we do have quite a number of our students who are either working full time oh, yeah. or who are graduate assistants. I mm -hmm. think Carolyn might have froze there. Oh, it was me that was frozen. I thought it was you. OK. Um, most of our folks that have a full time position, um, the ones that have a rigorous full time position and maybe a family, mm -hmm. from my advisement experience, a lot of them take one class every six week session, just one at a time. Mm -hmm. Some folks have a very lenient type of a job that gives them time to do their uh, work and they may take two at a time, that's full time, mm -hmm. two at one time. Um, so I also have people that start out by taking just one class to test the waters and then those folks say, oh, I'm gonna stick with one class or they say, no, I'm going to take the two classes. And because of the way we have it set up, they can catch up if they take it, a class in the winter or they end up taking two or three in the summer because we offer classes both sessions of the summer. <laughs> so it is definitely go at your own pace. I also have some folks that just take one each semester and they're taking their time. 
um, because they already have a good stable job and they're just working towards this degree and they have limitations on how much the employer will pay each year, mm -hmm. reimburse their tuition. Yeah. So um, I have all sorts of types in my advisement experience. That's great. So we have a couple of uh, good questions from the audience here. Um, is the statement of purpose an application requirement? And also, if I attend the Bloom in my undergrad, do I still need to submit my transcripts? So I can take the second part of that. Um, you do not need to submit your, your transcripts. Um, that's something that uh, we can request on your behalf as, as you know, a student who um, is an undergraduate at, at Bloomsburg. Um, and then Dr. Lamakia, Dr. Uh, Mihal, is the statement of purpose, is that a requirement? Well, I would like to talk to any student that is a BU student right now um, or a CU student right now, because if they have a certain GPA, then the only thing that's required is the application. We waive everything. Uh, but if they have under a 3.0, then they're going to have to do that uh, statement of intent. But students with a 3.0 undergraduate degree uh, from Commonwealth University, um, all the other points of the application are waived. They're they're called an automatically admitted student. Mm -hmm. So I would like to talk to them, um, you know, separately and let them know what they have to complete. But the transcript, if you are a CU student, you don't have to send your transcripts. We have them already. Thank you. Like Tom said. And this is a, a, a really good question. I don't know that we talked a lot about this subject. Um, if we are career changers and have been out of school for a while, do you also factor in current position at current career recommendations or anything else for admission? Um, I currently work at a hospital as a leader. Oh, great question. Um, that is a great question. Like sometimes we have a, a person that might not have a good undergraduate GPA, for example, but they worked in some area and they were very successful. Mm -hmm. And we consider that in the admission process. And if they work somewhere and, and they have recommendations and say they worked as a, um, maybe they were an inventory specialist at the hospital that really wasn't working in technology. I don't know what this person has. Mm -hmm. And they're a hard worker. You know, they look like they're an analytical thinker they would do fine in the program, even though they don't have an undergraduate technology degree. But we do consider with the GPA, if you've been out of school for a while and working and you were successful at work, we know that sometimes uh, we have different experience as an undergraduate student that doesn't really reflect our abilities at the time. That happens. Um, yeah, and, and honestly, a question. And, and that goes back to the the subject of like how the courses are run. So if, even if you're a person who's looking to change careers, um, you, you might be thinking, man, well, I'm not going to have, you know, like most jobs when you apply, you're like, oh, well, I need a year or two of experience to even get that the entry level job. Well, you're going to, you know, you're going to be able to build up this resume and this portfolio of work that you're going to be able to kind of check off that box along the way just by completing the degree. Um, so that, that's part of what makes this program so special in the way that Dr. Lamaki and Dr. Mial have built the program. Um, are there a limited number of graduate assistantship positions available? Again, that's, that's a really good question as well. So I can speak broadly. I know we have GA positions. And for those of you who are wondering, a grad assistantship is a uh, part-time position on campus um, where the student is, a, is the, kind of like a paraprofessional. Uh, they will work anywhere between 10 and 20 hours per week. Um, and the university would um, cover... Um, you know, a part of their tuition and they would get a paycheck. It's a great, I mean, it's a great opportunity. And we have GA positions all across all of our campuses at CU and at Bloomsburg. Um, I would say just about every department on campus, I shouldn't say every department, but there are a lot of departments on campus that have graduate assistantship opportunities. So there are, there is a, um, a finite amount, but I don't think that it's really limited. Um, I would say if you are a student who's looking to start in the spring of 24, or uh, the summer or fall of 24. Um, normally we will start to post the GA positions, like um, I would say like sometime over the winter. Um, 
and it's just like a job board. Like you'll see all the positions, all the minimum requirements. Um, and a lot of those are, you know, a lot of those positions are ideal for a full-time graduate student because we'll work around your classes um, too. So there's uh, normally a, a number of GA opportunities. I see Dr. Omaki has something to add. I would like to add something. Um, the MSIT students, and you can vouch for this, Tom, yeah. seem to be in demand when they apply for the GA positions because lots of folks want um, their technology, their data organized, and they like the technology savviness that starts to develop in our students. So um, they are a popular choice in the GA um, arena. And it is really terrific because if you have a GA position, for example, that requires you to work for 10 hours a week. And a lot of these are online working positions, not all of them, but many of them. You can take, um, if you take a minimum of three classes or nine credits, six of those class credits are paid for. Yeah. They're free. So if you took full time, four classes a semester, half of them would be for free and you would have to work 10 hours a week and you would get more experience that puts on your resume. So it is a very good deal. So there is a GA website reference for you and I you should look at it and apply. The application process to apply for GA is, is pretty simple. Mm -hmm. um, there might be an interview attached when they screen um, the GA applicants, but the application itself is one page. It's pretty easy to do. Yep, absolutely. And um, and so we have hired GAs that were in the uh, MSIT program in the past, and yeah, they've been outstanding because they fill the need that we absolutely have, which is working with data, working with analytics, because it's it's a very hard skill set to find. If I'm being very honest with you, um, so the MSIT GA applicants are normally in pretty high demand because of that. Uh, to, to no surprise if you've sat through this presentation. Um, and what's nice too is generally um, you'll be asked to do IT projects because you might be the only person in the office that has that skill set. And honestly, that might be the case at any company you work at too. Like you're going to be viewed as an asset because you might be the only person who's got that skill set to be able to do those things. So you become you know, you've got to see at the table when it talks, you know, when we talk about decision making and um, there's a limited amount of people that have that ability. Um, and it's like that with your GA, it seems like, and it's like that when you're on the job market as well. Um, that, that's, that's a great question. I appreciate you asking that. Um, what would be, what would the expected graduation date be for a full-time student beginning in the summer? Um, the expected graduation, oh, from the MSIT program, right. That would be spring 20, like if you started in the summer of 2024, you would graduate at the end of spring 2025. If you started off, let's say fall 2024, you would graduate in the summer of 2025. Does that, is that what you need to know? Hopefully. Yeah, if you could. If you're full time. Yes, yep. Okay, yes, it did. All right, great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lamakia. Yeah, no, these are these are outstanding questions. These are great questions. Anything else? Anything else for Dr. Wamakia, Dr. Mihal? And if not, that's 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 fine. I'm sure it's you know it's kind of you know capping off a long day. Um, if there's anything else that you think of. If, if you find you're like, oh, you know, I want to know more about this subject, um, please certainly, you know, let us know. Oh, and sorry, here's a, another question. Um, are class sizes similar to typical undergraduate level classes? Uh, typically, our classes are, well, the electives usually around um, maybe 20 or so. And then the other classes are at about 25. So that's our typical class sizes. Can these classes be started before the end of a bachelor? Oh, that's a great question. Um, there is um, the possibility to 
work on your graduate program before you finish your undergraduate program. And there is some classes in your undergraduate program that where you can double dip and apply the graduate classes to undergraduate requirements. For example, if you are a College of Business student, maybe something like a marketing major, there is electives in the program. You can use them towards the gra these graduate program classes can be used as electives towards your undergraduate. I would like to talk to you about your specific academic experience and look at your um, transcript and give you some guidance in that area so that uh, if you want to double dip, it is possible. That's a great question. Yeah, so what, what Dr. Lamock is referring to is like the accelerated program. Um, so if you're a current undergraduate and um, do you have to be in a business discipline, Dr. Lamock? No, you do not. Okay. You just um, have to have room on your undergraduate transcript and the department you're in, which could be, I have somebody in computer science right now. It could be in computer science, you could be in English, you could be somewhere. As long as you had room in your undergraduate requirement sheet and that department was happy with and was able to approve the courses that you were taking and satisfying some requirement, then we're all set. I just gave the example of the College of Business because that's what I see very often. Oh, okay. But that's a that's a great question. Yes. Yep. So this program is offered in an accelerated format and time is money. Right. So if you can shave off a semester, if you can shave off a year, like that's that's obviously to your advantage. So I'm I'm glad that you asked that. I forgot to mention that. Yeah, they're asking really good things. I know. This is this is great. It's been a great group for sure. Anything else? anybody in the group so thank you everybody for joining us you know really do appreciate it we went a little longer than what i i had uh originally expected but that's great because we had just a lot of really good questions so um again whether you watch live or whether you watch the recording you know thank you so much for joining us we hope to hear from everybody in the future and i hope you have a good day everybody. good night thank you thanks